Welcome, everybody. I'm Deirdre Hanford. I'm Chief Security Officer at Synopsys. I'm not here to just check your badges. Don't worry. Um, I wear many hats at the company, but my job tonight is to welcome you. And I just saw something really cool written on this whiteboard that said, we learn best in moments of enjoyment. So that's going to be our theme tonight. I know we're here to talk about AI, but we're learning best in moments of enjoyment. And that's just a beautiful, beautiful way to start an exciting evening. So first of all, I'd like to welcome you by lots and groups. So first of all, let's hear from our students. Yay, the students. And then we'll follow the money. How about the parents? Thank you, parents. Of course, we have alumni here as well. So let's hear from the alumni. Woohoo! And uh, of course, their more important significant other, friends and spouses. So welcome, welcome. And then, of course, we have members of the faculty here as well. So thank you for coming. And the staff that really makes things happen here. So welcome to the staff also. And I know we have other, besides members of the Dean Society, we have other members of the engineering community. So we, I'd like to welcome all of you to Synopsis. And I probably forgot a category. So apologies in advance for that. But welcome to the Synopsis headquarters. I want to spend a minute setting context. Many of you that live down here in Silicon Valley no doubt, no doubt know who we are. But I'm going to give you the Synopsis brief history with the Berkeley lens. Because we were founded in 1986. And and we expanded from a tiny little synthesis startup to now being an over $5 billion company, um, went public in 1992. We're a global software leader in basically helping people do chip design. And that's kind of, that's where we are. But our roots were very interesting. We spun out of General Electric, but we have deep, deep, deep Berkeley roots here at Synopsys. Um, I was a student of Richard Newton's. Um, we also had, and Richard was on our board of, at Synopsys. Alberto San Giovanni Vincentelli was also, you know, a key early partner in the Synopsys journey. And we did a, uh, with help of my colleague, uh, Bob Freeman, we did a little search in the help of HR. We have at least 46 Berkeley engineers just working in this campus. And that's uh, pretty remarkable when you think about, you know, the, the excellence at this company, of course, is attributable to uh, all those wonderful Berkeley grads, right? Okay, come on, let's work that. So, but we're, we're a leader in um, design tools, IP and security software that's really fueling a lot of what's happening in semiconductor. But of course, we're committed to academic partnerships. And this includes uh, close partnerships with uh, UC Berkeley College of Engineering. We have, an, I don't want to get into naming names, but we have a number of professors that we're, we're closely with. And also through our software program, a lot of folks in, in courses or in research Research are using Synopsys technology to do their really important work. And so we're super proud. And, and also, I'm very, very proud to be on uh, Suche's Industry Advisory Board. And uh, that's important work as well. And we're really thankful for that. So that's a little bit about Synopsys and our commitment to academic partnerships. But tonight, we're here to talk about the AI revolution. And what an exciting time. And we are so fortunate to hear from some amazing experts tonight. They're going to give us even more insight because what company isn't being completely transformed by AI right now in their products, in the way they go to market, in their enterprise? I mean, it's remarkable to see all the different ways that AI is transforming our lives, but also trans transforming entire companies. So what an important topic to cover this evening at this very, very important panel. And I know, Sujay, you'll be introducing our panelists in a minute, so I'll let you have that honor. So Synopsys is pleased to host you. We're super excited about the industry's link and personal links to universities. But now I want to get personal for a minute because you all are here because you're stakeholders in Berkeley. You, maybe you are professionally groomed at Berkeley. Maybe you became who you are academically and intellectually because you matured at Berkeley. And 
many of you give not only your time, but you are, are giving philanthropy and you're giving your own funds to Berkeley. And we'd really like to thank you for that because everyone thinks, oh, it's a state school. All the money clearly comes from Sacramento. That's really not the case. And your philanthropy makes a huge, huge, huge difference. And as you sit here tonight and enjoy this beautiful venue, but more importantly, these incredible, incredibly gifted people, think about what Berkeley gave to you, the gift that Berkeley gave to you, and consider the gift that you are and will continue to give to Berkeley. And if you're inspired by tonight, you're inspired by your Berkeley roots or your Berkeley roots of your child, look up Jasmine because she's here to tell you all about how you can continue to be a, not only a, a, a committed stakeholder of Berkeley, but someone who's truly vested in Berkeley's future. So, so thank you for even considering that. So now I have my last honor of the evening uh, is to welcome Dean Sujay King Liu. And don't don't get up yet because we got we got a lot to talk about here. So first of all, this is going to be horrifying if you didn't know this already. Sujay got her bachelor's, master's, and doctor degree in electrical engineering at that other school, the one that's down here where they read, wear a lot of red. So um, <clears throat> we're still puzzled by that, but she spent the bulk of her career at UC Berkeley, so thank, we're thankful for that. A little known fact, she spent a little bit of time actually at Synopsys. That's another story. But since joining the faculty in 1996, she's held numerous leadership roles on campus before being named the Engineer College of Engineering's 13th Dean, 13th Dean in 2018. Over the decades, Sujay's earned high regard for her achievements as an instructor, mentor, administrator, and has international recognition, awards, patents for innovations in SEMI. Page two. Uh, this includes her role in the development of the FinFET. Yes, she has a very, very strong um, roots in the, the development of the FinFET. And I think I don't need to explain what that is. Probably most of you in this room have some insight on that. Recently, she's championed the goals of the Chips and Science Act and is successfully advocating for support. She advocated for the support of the bill. And she's really been a key driver in this country for workforce development in support of the Chips Act. And this is with her leadership in the American Semiconductor Academy Initiative. And Suche also serves on the Industrial Advisory Committee for um, uh, Secretary Gina Raimondo to advise on the implementation of the uh, CHIPS R&D funds. So we're very, very pleased. And on the IAC, she actually leads the Workforce Committee. She's a founding member of the EDGE Consortium, which is all about bringing more and more diversity into our field. And this is something she lives and breathes every day at Berkeley, but this is also something that uh, we need to, do, to address as an industry. I was thrilled to meet a number of uh, female engineers here today, uh, but we always need more diversity in our engineering programs. She's one of the leaders of the Northwest AI Hardware Hub that's jointly led by UC Berkeley and that other school over there um, in Palo Alto. And uh, that hub was recently awarded uh, significant funds by the Department of Defense for their piece of the CHIPS Act. She's elected member of the National Academy of Engineering. And for those of you that don't know, that's a really big deal. Um, she's a fellow of the National Academy of Inventors and also in her spare time is a board member at Intel and Max Linear. So please welcome our Dean, Sujay King Liu. Wow, thank you so much, Deirdre, for that very, very um, gracious introduction, and good evening, everyone. How are you all doing? Great. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, I first want to acknowledge um, Deirdre and Synopsis for hosting this Dean Society event in such a beautiful venue and um, in such an enjoyable uh, setting. <laughs> and so I, I do hope that you will enjoy tonight's um, event and take away some new insights. Um, so I'm first of all, I'd like to just say I'm really proud that Deirdre is a member of my engineering advisory board. She's really provided lots of sage advice to help ensure that um, Berkeley engineering stays preeminent in, in the country and the world. Um, and we, we really, I also enjoy serving together with her on the Industrial Advisory Committee for Secretary Raimondo uh, to help ensure that um, our taxpayer dollars are spent wisely to advance um, uh, U.S. technological leadership and uh, national security. So um, I just wanted to take a, a moment to 
thank all of you in person. This is a rare opportunity to meet in person uh, since the pandemic. So thank you all, alumni, parents, um, Dean Society members, and friends and family for your generous and continuing support of Berkeley Engineering. You know, your engagement here uh, really helps us to advance our mission of educating future leaders and making a positive impact on society. Now, I'd like to take a moment because there are a lot of faculty uh, colleagues here, and our faculty are key to the success of the university. They teach, they do research, they actually help run uh, the, the administration. So I'd like to maybe invite all of the faculty who are here with us today to stand up just to be recognized. So later on, maybe people can find you and ask you questions as well. <laughs> Let's give them a hand. Excellent. All right, thank you. Now, I hope you had enjoyed not only the food, but the opportunity to talk with our, some of our amazing students who are here with us tonight to see firsthand the results of your generous support of the college. Their work reflects the excellence of our engineering undergraduate and graduate programs, and um, this wouldn't be possible with support from the Berkeley Engineering Fund. So these future engineering leaders really give us hope that um, our collective future will be brighter. So let's give our students a hand. So I think many of you already know that one of my priorities as dean is really to transform the culture of engineering to make it more welcoming and inclusive because we really want to enhance our students' learning experience to help shape them into uh, more successful leaders who will help uh, pave a brighter uh, way to a brighter future for all of us. Um, so the new engineering center, yes, I have a prop here. <laughs> New Engineering Center, we're actually making tremendous progress in fundraising and is actually already under construction. Um, but we have a little more to go in terms of fundraising. And we'd like to reach our goal uh, by the end of the current uh, Berkeley campus Light the Way campaign, which ends in just two months. So if you haven't done so already, please take some time to take a look at the renderings and learn more about this project, if you don't already know about it, uh, towards the back of the room. Um, as some of you may already know, my husband, even though I got my degrees at a different school. My husband earned his Berkeley EECS degree from, Ber from Berkeley, and so we really believe in this project. We, want, we believe in the transformational impact it will have. So we've committed our own largest gift ever given by our family to help bring this project to, uh, to reality. And I, so I'd like to also express gratitude. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> oh, I forgot to say earlier, just to counter what Deirdre said, you know, I've spent many years at Berkeley now, and really, I, I do truly say honestly that Berkeley has shaped me into the kind of leader that I am today. So I give full credit to Berkeley Engineering. <laughs> so I'd like to express heartfelt thanks to all of you who've already generously supported this project. Several of you are here this evening, and that includes Deirdre um, and her husband. So thank you all for your s support. Um, now, if you would like to make a new or additional gift to this project, it's actually an opportune time to do so. Right now, any gift, all gifts over $100,000 or more will be matched one to one. So um, my assistant dean, uh, Jasmine Payne, and all of our colleagues here can help answer any questions you might have about this um, exciting opportunity. And of course, all gifts that are committed, not necessarily paid, but committed by the end of this calendar year, calendar year will count towards the Berkeley uh, Light the Way campaign. All right, so now before introducing our panelists, I have just a couple of slides to share with you some updates from the college that relate to today's topic of um, artificial intelligence. So as you may know, UC Berkeley is the top, is consistently ranked the top public university in the country by US News and World Report. Um, and this reflects the excellence and the impact, as well as the international reputation of our programs. Uh, Berkeley's graduate and undergraduate programs in electrical engineering and computer science are consistently ranked, the top ranked, and, and our faculty and our students have there, it's thanks to their innovations that have led to advances in artificial intelligence. So it's no wonder that these majors, in EECS and CS, are among the most popular on our campus today. Now, Berkeley continues to lead the way in AI and machine learning research with applications that accelerate scientific discovery and innovation, and, that in, and these will enable us to engineer better health, shape a more sustainable future, and advance democracy and equality. 
On the next slide, um, just want to point out, Time Magazine recent, recently published its list of the 100 most influential people in AI. And we'd like to point out that Berkeley is very well represented among this group of 100, with 11 representatives on that list. These include students, alums, faculty, and a member of my engineering advisory board, whom I'm going to introduce soon. And we are truly delighted that she could join us here tonight for a panel. Now, thanks to Berkeley's vibrant entrepreneurship ecosystem, we can now accelerate the tech transfer process of our engineering innovations more quickly to society. You might not know that Berkeley has the most alums who have successfully um, raised venture capital funding for their startup companies. And the College of Engineering supports programs and center that, centers that contribute to that success. So these include the Satarja Center for Entrepreneurship and Technology, our Management Entrepreneurship and Technology Program that's joint with the Haas School of Business, the Baker Fellows Program, and Berkeley Skydeck Accelerator, to name just a few. But, you know, as technologies designed and built by engineers have transformative impact on the way that people live, work, and play, it's really incumbent upon us to consider the societal impact that our innovations will have. So tonight, we'll, we will delve into the topic of the AI revolution, not just how we are leaders in advancing AI technology, but also on how we are tackling the difficult social and ethical questions that come with advances in technology. So with that, let me start to introduce our panelists. So first, Shomit Ghosh makes it his business to keep a finger on the pulse of trends in industry as a partner at a venture capital firm, Clear Vision Ventures. He shares his expertise as an industry fellow at our Sutarja Center for Entrepreneurship and Technology. And most notably, Shomit is a Berkeley alum with a bachelor's degree in computer science. Please join me in welcoming Shomit. <laughs> Next. Professor Jatendra Malik is among Berkeley's most distinguished faculty, known for his pioneering work in computer vision, which led to his election to the National Academy of Engineering. He is the Arthur C. Chick Professor of Electrical Engineering and Computer Sciences and currently chair of the Computer Sciences Division. And he holds joint appointments in bioengineering and the programs in cognitive science and vision science. Uh, please join me in welcoming Jatendra. Now, just a moment ago, I mentioned Time Magazine's list of 100 most influential people in AI. We're very fortunate to have one of them here, Sandra Rivera, on our panel tonight. Sandra is the Executive Vice President and General Manager of Intel's Data Center and AI Group. And just a few weeks ago, Intel announced that it would make its Programmable Solutions Group a standalone business with Sandra as CEO. I'm honored to have her serve on my engineering advisory board as well. Please join me in welcoming Sandra. Okay, so let's start by um, maybe asking each of our panelists to give a brief overview of, overview of their research or their involvement in AI, what they're most excited about, and what they think are areas of greatest potential or possible concern. And after that, we'll start with some questions to, sp uh, to start a discussion. Maybe we start with Shomit? Sure, is this on? Yeah, works. Thank you. So um, thank you very much, Sujay, for the very kind uh, introduction and the invitation here. Um, as Sujay mentioned, I'm a venture capitalist, so I invest in early stage companies that are uh, driving innovation. Um, in particular, my focus is on companies that are using uh, AI to actually disrupt business models. Um, we have a couple of, our focus really is on sustainability at our fund, and we have a couple of companies that are actually using machine learning to do everything from cracking carbon footprint to also doing pricing of carbon credits. So that's my professional role there. Uh, additionally, of course, I teach at, uh, at Sutarja Center through the uh, College of Engineering. I also teach at the University of San Francisco. In both cases, I teach basically uh, data-driven business models. I write quite a bit as well for the Sutarja Center on all topics, AI, machine learning, data-driven business models, um, also all of the issues on data ethics, everything from energy footprint to using dark patterns in, in uh, behavioral economics to drive behavior. Uh, what gets me most excited nowadays, everyone is really familiar in this group, I know, with that chat GPT, and probably most of you are al also aware it's the transformer, the T in GPT, which is really the revolutionary technology within the neural network. And the T, the transformer, is super powerful 
enormously protean. It can do everything, not just do language generation, but it can do drug design, it can do robotics, cybersecurity, very powerful. So I, what I see here, the opportunity and potential is the enterprise applications that will spill from the transformer. Um, there are a whole bunch of different technologies of generative AI. Again, most of you are probably familiar with this, but it's not just the transformer that's, that's fueling generative AI. We also have Poisson flow generative models. We have generative adversarial networks. We have variational autoencoders, diffusion, all these different techniques to do generation creation. And I think this is why I find this really exciting in the enterprise side, because generative AI maybe gives the same sort of promise that human beings bring, which is the promise of creativity. So that's what really gets me excited. Um, certainly there are downsides. Everything that humanity has ever invented has had plus sides and minus sides. And um, some of the uh, consumer applications of generative AI give me a little bit of pause, frankly, because you, know, you can do everything from propaganda generation using LLMs. You can do a lot of image generation for deep fakes using diffusion and, and GANs. Um, and all the while, of course, creating a, a carbon footprint. Uh, so the carbon footprint for AI is, is, is pretty heavy. The work just came out of the University of Amsterdam that um, by 2027, uh, AI will create the same carbon footprint as the country of Indonesia, which I think is the fourth largest population on the planet. So a lot of things for us to think about. Um, and it's the, it's, I think it's the consumer applications, which give me a little bit of pause, uh, just the, the ways that that might get deployed. Um, you know, finally, let me just say that if you think about um, biomarkers, um, it's been found that uh, the, the spread of fast food has been a biomarker for obesity and all of these societal ills. And I worry that uh, generative AI might serve as a biomarker for some of the societal damage that might ensue. So I think those are the kinds of things we need to watch out for. Thank you. Um, Chitendra? Uh, thank you. Thank you first for inviting me and for the nice words here. Uh, I, have, I came to Berkeley in 1985, and I also got my degree at that other school with lots of red stuff. Uh, but uh, unlike, uh, I think compared to Sujay, I've been whitewashed for longer by having been at Berkeley for uh, whatever, 37 years now. And when I came to Berkeley, there were two faculty who did what they called was AI. And, at, and I was like the third. I mean, there was Lotfi Zade and Robert Wilensky. Sadly, none of them is alive anymore. And we grew from that. And at that time, AI was a curiosity. I mean, a little thing that people played with, but the serious stuff was not that. I mean, and uh, and today, uh, I mean, Berkeley AI Research, we have a center which has something like 50 faculty. Uh, Many in EECS, mostly in EECS, but not just in EECS. I mean, it's important to say that AI extends beyond that and into the rest of the university. We have colleagues from psychology, we have colleagues from neuroscience, and increasingly areas in basic science like astronomy and uh, biology and so on who hope to benefit from the techniques that, that AI and machine learning can bring to bear. So that's one point. This the revolution in AI has been created over the years by the work of many people, and Berkeley has played a significant role. Our faculty, our students, our alumni. I mean, just, just take one example. The most recent craze is due to ChatGPT. The technical lead of ChatGPT at OpenAI was John Schulman, who is one of our PhD graduates from a few years ago. I taught him computer vision, for example. Uh, so, and uh, today, so many of our, uh, I mean, the universe, it, it's like a big area in academia and in, in industry. And uh, like there's a big demand, and the, the faculty who are being hired, Berkeley is like the number one place from where we produce the people who go and teach at other places. I have this joke when we have, uh, when we in, in have our grad student visit day, I tell them, you can come to Berkeley and be taught by us, or you can go to MIT or Stanford or whatever and be taught by our students. That's your choice, <laughs> okay? And uh, it really is true. I have a map which, <laughs> which captures that. Uh, I want to say a little bit about uh, the history of AI and uh, where I think it's going. Uh, the ideas really go back to post-World War II. Uh, sort of the beginnings of computing and communication and all these revolutions. 
So people like Turing, people like Shannon, people like Bellman, people like Kalman, people like Wiener. So this goes back to th people like John McCarthy, Minsky. So these were great ideas from the 50s. And there have been developments over these years which have culminated in what we see today. Why now? Well, because the computing and the data have caught up. So even though someone like me is an AI researcher, our successes are due to all of you who contributed to the computing and data revolution, from the chips all the way up. So I, I like to remind all my colleagues in AI that we literally, you know, there's this line from Newton that we, we, we have made more progress because we stand on the shoulders of giants. In my case, it's the shoulders of the silicon people and the intermediate and the chip people and all the way up. And uh, so this gives us some insight into uh, where the developments in AI are today. Uh, so I'll pick on three fields. These are the ones I know best, language, vision, and robotics. Language is the furthest ahead. Why? Because the data for language is all available on the web. You know, So you can get a trillion tokens from Wikipedia, all the literature, Reddit, whatever. So that knowledge is available in a digitized form on the web, and now people, it can be downloaded and used to train systems, and that's what's been done. Next, you have vision. You have trillions of photos on the web. But converting from images to tokens is non-trivial. I've spent 30 years of my life doing that, and it, there are still insights there. So we have substantial progress. Recognition systems work remarkably well, but uh, uh, 3D vision is not solved. Understanding video is not solved. And then finally, robotics. Robotics is the hardest of these. Why? Because the data is the scarcest. Data would correspond to individuals' embodied experiences, which is not available on the web. And uh, how do we produce the data? You will, you'll do it with simulation. You'll do it with training in the real world. The hardware is important. The mechanical engineering aspects are important. So again, it's a journey which is going on. So in my view, AI is not done. It's, AI, AGI is not here. We, have, we are on a journey. We have made major advances, hopefully for the good, even though some will be for the bad. But there is so much more to do. And in that sense, I, 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 it's just an exciting time to be, and I hope uh, many of you in the audience have some uh, opportunity to capture that excitement, which I feel after 37 years of Berkeley. Thank you. Thank you. Sandra. Uh, thank you. Thank you for inviting me this evening with uh, this esteemed panel. Uh, as um, Dr. C.J. Uh, King Liu uh, described, I lead the data center and AI organization for Intel. So I'm one of those low in the in the stack chip people uh, <laughs> that Jitendra just uh, spoke about. And my responsibility is to build the systems, the software, and the silicon that power so much of the world's compute. And, um, and clearly, uh, this is really a revolution that we're living through right now. So I don't think it's, it's an exaggeration to call it the AI revolution, because AI really is impacting every single industry every single uh, way uh, that we work, live, and play. And, and uh, echoing Jitendra's comments, we are really just at the beginning of AI. And uh, although AI and machine learning have been around for many decades, um, it really has highly accelerated since the 2017-18 uh, uh, transformer uh, technology came to market because it became so much more accessible uh, and the accelerated computing power of the transformer uh, became so much more powerful in terms of just how many uh, industries and applications it could actually um, impact and, uh, and the level of productivity and efficiency uh, promise that it held with it. So, um, so today, you know, many of the the ways that I am involved in AI is in this enterprise type of, of applications. And if I look at Intel alone, Intel is uh, a chip design and manufacturing company. When we look at just semiconductor uh, manufacturing, these are very um, large scale 
uh, factories, we call them fabs, uh, that uh, that cost you know tens of billions of dollars uh, to actually um, uh, stand up, and you know the manufacturing process is one that is uh, exacting. Um, it has to be uh, very uh, precise. Uh, the geometries are. Um, almost unfathomable when you can think about a bill, a hundred billion transistors on uh, something that is just uh, on a, a few centimeters uh, footprint. Uh, the, we use a lot of AI in that semiconductor manufacturing process to improve the, the defect density, improve the quality, and lower the cost. And so much of our uh, goal at Intel uh, has been through our history, our 50, you know, five-year history, to lower barriers to entry, increase market participation, and accelerate the rate of innovation, which is very much aligned with uh, the philosophy and the the public good that a public university like uh, Berkeley um, really uh, represents. So uh, this idea that we need to uh, lower barriers to entry and uh, bring AI everywhere is one that we truly internalize at Intel in the ways that we try to make the computing asset more economic, more accessible, more available uh, to more people. Um, you know, one of the things that uh, that you know, my colleagues talked about a lot of the uh, applications in many different sectors uh, in every vertical, whether it's financial services or retail, uh, whether it is you know robotics or uh, autonomous vehicles, um, whether it's education uh, or manufacturing. Uh, AI, machine learning touches everything, and it holds the promise of greater productivity and greater efficiency. Um, and you know these are all good and positive things, uh, but there are questions around ethics uh, in in AI and bias in the algorithms and um, and the 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 accessibility of the technology. And one of the concerns that certainly we have is that um, academic institutions like Berkeley do not have access to sufficient compute to do the important research that uh, that you know that the students and the faculty are trying to drive to use AI for good and this is one of the uh, commitments that we have is how do we make that computing much more accessible to academic research um, institutions uh, to government and then how do we ensure that AI is used for good. Um, and we believe strongly that that can only be done in the open. Uh, we believe in open source, open standards, accessibility, um, making compute and the massive amounts of compute it takes to create these foundational and frontier models available uh, to uh, partners in academia, uh, working with government and regulators and industry to establish a code of ethics uh, for AI and uh, and some frankly necessary regulation to ensure that you know these powerful tools that we've built are used uh, for good. So. Um, so I'm very excited about uh, everything that AI represents. We are truly just at the beginning, uh, not at, at the end of AI. Um, but we all have a collective responsibility both to make uh, AI available to everyone, everywhere, and to ensure uh, that it is used for, for good purposes and that we actually uh, drive positive outcomes um, in terms of society for the use of this you know, very powerful, very important technology. Great. Thanks so much, Sandra. I think we're really appreciative of um, efforts by the researchers and companies like Intel to ensure that AI doesn't exacerbate inequities that exist in society, but rather um, promote equity. Your comment made me, it's just interesting, just last week, one of our faculty colleagues, Jintendra, you, I'm not going to to say the name, but he was explaining how, how uh, we would like to stand up a new graduate course on large language models. But um, he said the budget needed for the compute, we need to spend about $3,000 per student. And we estimate there'll be hundreds of students who want to take this course. Now, on average at Berkeley, the amount of funding we have for TAs, you know, lectures and so on for each student in a class is about $100 per student. So I don't even know how we're going to afford to be able to teach our students who are interested to learn about large language models. So. Yes, the challenge of making it more accessible, including lowering the cost, energy consumption of uh, AI algorithms is certainly going to be a, a challenge. Um, one question that a lot of people are 
concerned about, especially young people, uh, our students, is about the impact on jobs. Mm -hmm. So um, I've heard uh, a professor at another school across the bay <laughs> um, saying that in the past, auto automation eliminated a lot of low-level, low-paid jobs. But now the second revolution of uh, AI, automation with AI, can eliminate a lot of high-paying jobs. So what is your view on this? I, you mentioned increased productivity. Does that mean that there will be fewer jobs or just the nature of the jobs will change? Yeah, I, you know, I, I get this question a lot, uh, CJ, and I believe that um, that AI will replace the the people that do not embrace AI uh, to do <laughs> uh, jobs, meaning that AI will make us all more uh, productive and efficient and the nature of our work and the rote nature of some of the things that we do uh, may be uh, supplemented or um, or replaced by AI tools. And I think about you know something very uh, simple we we showed. Uh, at our Intel Innovation event just last month, uh, an application running on an AI PC, right? Enough computing power uh, with uh, with enough you know, um, uh, algorithmic capability in terms of, of an application that is listening all the time uh, and is uh, is tracking all of your uh, your emails, your documents, and really just your work. Uh, product out of your your laptop and it can replay and rewind for you uh, and summarize your conversations it can um, if I if I spoke with you last uh, you know quarter and we had another one-on-one -on -one meeting uh, I could just uh, you know ask my my laptop hey can you summarize for me the the key points that uh, CJ and I discussed um, so that I can remind myself, you know, what what those topics were and what actions we took and and what came of that. Or can you send uh, uh, an email to uh, to CJ uh, summarizing what we discussed and uh, proposing an agenda of new topics or kind of a, a next phase in in, in some of those. Um, some of those initiatives that we agreed on together. So you can see that rather than spending all that time doing the research, going back, um, you know, typing out that email, I can be much more efficient. So I don't worry so much that uh, the AI replaces jobs um, if you embrace the idea that, you know, technology and tools are uh, a way that we can improve our lives and can improve productivity and efficiency. And uh, and fighting that is probably not the, the right approach. And, and I just, I think about uh, just a, a very simple example of, you know, toll collectors uh, on the highways and how it, it was a very big pushback uh, in terms of embracing, you know, uh, uh, you know automatic toll collecting uh, because there was this, this uh, notion that it wasn't safe or that it, it was uh, something that would, uh, eliminate jobs, but in fact, it was safer. Um, those jobs uh, were not necessary, but you know, other jobs, better jobs, were were created. So I, I just uh, believe that we 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 can't fight uh, technology and progress. We should embrace it and think about ways that uh, and and really utilize the technology to make us more uh, effective, efficient, and frankly, uh, to find more. A joy in the work that we do and, and less having that rote and repetitious uh, type of, of, uh, of work. That's great. So I'll come back to Jatendra. Um, Professor Malik actually had t spent quite some time working at a company called Meta, uh, and, and he's also been at Berkeley for many, dec for, for many years. So I was just wondering, Jatendra, can you tell us what do you think about the role of academia versus industry for advancing AI and ensuring that it's responsibly used? you know, um, sort of minimizing unintended negative consequences? Uh, uh, thank you. Yeah, so uh, as I said, my career has largely been in academia, but uh, in 2018, I went off and I led the Facebook AI research. It was at that time called Facebook, so FAIR. I led the research lab in AI in Menlo Park for a couple of years and helped grow it, and I'm still connected with them and I spent some time there. So I've had a, and before that I spent time at Google. So I've had a chance to see both the industrial side and the academic side. And I think this is one of the great things about the, the American ecosystem, which is that somehow we have found a way to have a good use of both of these modes of work. But uh, maybe I'll say a few things uh, just to make it 
very obvious. Uh, industry, uh, often in academia, there's this term explore versus exploit in the AI literature or in the reinforcement learning literature. Explore means trying lots of things. And exploit means picking the winners and then betting. You know, once you know that that's the number which gives you the most money, you put down $1,000, right? So we need to do both. Academia is good at explore because a grad student trying something, if it fails, fine, it fails. You try something else. Uh, industry is very good at taking things to scale. So once you know that here is an approach which works, but you need to magnify it a thousand times. Academia doesn't have that capability. Industry does. So, but the research ecosystem needs both. So right now, we have uh, LLMs are the, the thing of the day, right? Large language models. Okay, they arose from ideas, which again, I can give a long sequence lecture on sort of how they arose today, where the early ideas, a lot of them were developed in in uh, academia, and then there was the scaling up phenomena, where there was the transformer model, then there was some work at universities, then there was the paper at Google, then, then at OpenAI. There's a long history, but both academia and industry play a role. Right now, of course, there's the scaling up effect, which many companies are trying. Academia can't do it, because I don't have access to 20,000 GPUs. I cannot train the model at the scale that one of the big companies can. Now, uh, but there is a risk here, which is that we are betting on this one horse, and the, the, the future uh, big ideas, they need to be encouraged to. And though that academia is very good at, because academia can take these risks at small scale in a very easy way. But to how do we let academia, how do we nurture that in academia? Then we have these challenges, right? I mean, Sujay already alluded to compute. We have the challenge of uh, attracting people to uh, be faculty members uh, because, uh, I mean, just the salary differential, the financial differential between uh, what uh, a top AI graduate would earn in industry versus academia is significant. We need to, when we hire faculty, we need to give them the resources to be successful. Right, like a startup package. I mean, uh, uh, they, because they need to set up their lab, they need to have equipment, they need to, uh, you know, hire students and pay them before they can write grants, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Anyway, my point is that if academia shrivels, five years later, industry will shrivel, because your seed cap, your, it's like eating your seed. Your farmers have to plant the seeds to get the crop, but they cannot plant. If you eat all your seed, you are in trouble, right? Yeah. So, and that is a, is a serious concern, and 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 I think this is why we need to find a way for both sectors to be healthy. And uh, I, I think I'll end there. Okay, so maybe one more question for Shomit before I open it up. Um, so just this week, uh, we saw that Pre President Biden issued a new executive order in, in, intended to help ensure that measures will be taken by our government to um, make sure that AI development um, proceeds in a way that's going to guarantee safety, security, you know, well-being for people in, in society in this country. So what do you think will be the impact of legislation and how can we plan for that or, or influence that going forward? Yeah, so I was really actually happy to see that. It's, it's something that's needed. Um, think about every product that we interface with in our daily lives otherwise is controlled by the FDA, the USDA, uh, National Highway Traffic Safety Commission, et cetera. So it was inevitable that this would also happen in the field of AI. And AI, because it has such a broad reach, and you release a product, it goes worldwide that instant. So the impacts are actually pretty far reaching. It's not just re restricted to a certain geography. Um, as well, the, uh, the impacts are multifaceted. So AI brings, as, as uh, Jitendra and um, Sandra have mentioned, um, issues of fairness. Is the training data representative? If not, it's going to create inequitable results. This is a difficult thing to actually identify and figure out. Um, it's the, uh, the issue of using behavioral economics that's uh, driven by big data to do dark pattern behavioral economics, influencing, invisibly influencing people's behavior. 
the issue of power consumption also, as both Sandra and Jitendra have talked about, power consumption is huge. Um, creating a single NLP model is, creates the same carbon footprint as five automobiles for the life of the automobile. So you know, these are all uh, really substantial um, climate penalties that are out there. And there's a worry that if we use all of this, this energy for trivial tasks, the people who end up paying the, the price for it, of course, are in the global south who benefit from this not at all. So we have to be very deliberate, very circumspect about how we deploy and use AI. One of the things I think that um, President Biden highlighted there was also the issue of job loss. And this is also building on what's, what Sandra said. Um, I view automation as being the, um, the tension between Iron Man and Terminator. So you think about Terminator, fully automated, sent here to kill us. Iron Man, technology augmenting the best of us. And I think we have to consciously seek out those Iron Man solutions. If not, you look at one job category, um, driving large trucks. Four million people drive large trucks in America. It's the highest paying job you can get without even a high school diploma. What happens when we, when we have fully self-driving trucks obsoleting an entire class of employment? How will we find employ employment for those four million displaced workers plus all the industries that they support? So we have to be very deliberate because I think if we view it solely through the lens of um, economics and productivity, uh, then none of us can compete against AI. You know, we, uh, we lose to, uh, to Moore's Law, basically. So I think we have to be really deliberate about this. We have to consciously think about, is this Iron Man or is it Terminator? There are huge societal you know, problems that ensue if we pursue Terminator solutions. Some people will make money because of the productivity you drive, but you know, robots don't eat at the corner diner, they don't go to 49ers games, they don't watch TV commercials, they don't pay taxes. So much of our, uh, the, f you know, the foundation of, of our society everywhere in the world is based on jobs. And I think we, we have to be very circumspect before we eviscerate that solely for the reasons of, uh, of um, economics. So anyway, I was very pleased to see what President Biden is doing this week. It's been a kind of companion announcement that came out of the UK, the Bleshley Park uh, Agreement. Um, we need all of these things because to, you know, to date, there hasn't been enough oversight. And you know, this is an industry that, as all industries do, um, it needs the oversight. Yeah, I just want to echo, I, I could not agree more. Uh, we're so pleased to see the government stepping forward and uh, and providing some guidance and, and regulation um, because, uh, as, uh, as Shomit uh, touched on, there is... Uh, so many, there are so many unintended consequences if it's not thought through. And we know what's happened um, in terms of just the amount of misinformation and disinformation because we have not actually, we didn't do anything uh, ahead of time to anticipate, again, these unintended consequences. So, uh, so we're very supportive of the executive order as well. I think one of the things that, that and, and we're working uh, you know, with uh, the Biden administration and uh, of course, uh, as, uh, as CJ mentioned, uh, the Chips and Science Act we think is, is, a, is an excellent deposit in uh, future technology innovation for our country to stay competitive and, um, and to lead the, the world in so many important uh, technologies. So we continue to work with the Biden administration and, and what we want to see is um, some differentiation between high risk uh, types of, of industries or applications like law enforcement, like hiring and firing, um, like you know, facial recognition technologies, like social tagging um, uh, use cases, which is different from kind of general purpose AI, computer vision at the, the checkout uh, counter. I mean, things like, like that are, are more general purpose and, and probably not as high risk as, as some of these other areas. So, um, so I, I just, you know, certainly from, from the Intel perspective, we do applaud uh, the work that's going on here and uh, we'll be very happy to continue to work again with industry and government on ensuring that, uh, that we are thinking ahead and anticipating um, and warding off uh, those unintended consequences, those kind of worst outcomes. Right. May I jump in with one slogan, which is there is AI and there is IA. So IA is intelligent agents or intelligence augmentation. And in my mind, we should keep this dual perspective. When we, I mean, it was, you put it in terms of Iron Man and Terminator, but I like to do it with AI and IA. Because if you think of AI, you think of it as replacements 
autonomous entities which do whatever they wish. And then we get into these worries about are their values aligned with our values. Whereas, I think most applications of, a of AI should be for IA, for augmenting our abilities, for intelligence augmentation. And I need to retain the autonomy, the decision-making, final decision-making authority. But this computer program is assisting me because it can calculate faster than me. It can retrieve information better than me, and so mm -hmm. on. And can I actually add something here, uh, something which is going to be completely out of left field. But think about this. During the 20th century, the foundation of our economy, you know, the government provided the substrate. We have roads, ports, electricity, water, et cetera. The substrate for the 21st century economy is going to be AI. But as Jitendra and Sandra and Sujay have all mentioned, we don't have access to it. Mm. You know, so this, the access is largely not there. A few companies have it, but everybody now needs to depend on it. Um, but they don't have access. So should the government be doing it? It's completely out of the left field proposed. Should the government be mm -hmm. providing infrastructure for the 21st century just as it has done for the 20th century? This is a, an element of you know, national competitive competition. Yeah, well, you know, and it's not unlike the Internet. Isn't the Internet a basic utility that everyone needs? And why is it viewed differently from uh, th the telephone? Uh, you know, and FCC uh, you know, regulates the telephone uh, industry uh, or telecommunications. But, you know, the Internet sort of got away from us. And that's why, you know, I, I just feel so strongly that we should not repeat those mistakes now with, with AI. Right. Right? Yeah, and um, the people here may know that there is a, as we speak, there is a lung cancer drug in human clinical trials from in silico medicine, completely designed by a generative adversarial network. So if you're a pharmaceutical firm, you need access to computing cycles, but you don't have access to that. You're still depending on wet lab chemistry. Massive disadvantage for industry in general, not just the, the companies or you know, individual companies. It's a problem for the industry in general. And as, as you mentioned, Sujay, you, know, you can't even train the students because it's so expensive to do so. Well, thank you so much for giving us a lot of food for thought. Mm -hmm. I think that sets the f uh, foundation for some provocative questions, I'm hoping. Mike, we're going to start with a student, Jesus. Hello. Thank you for all the, the nice food for thought. Um, and I want to focus my question around something that I heard uh, from Jaron Lanier on campus just a couple weeks ago. Um, it was about data ethics. Um, so my question is, um, how are data ethics actually affecting the speed at which development is, is done, is made. Um, and an example that I'll give is um, a problem that I'm looking at in class with uh, professors Matei Zaharia and Don, Don Song is the self-consumption of data um, produced by ChatGPT. So like, if ChatGPT produces material and then it takes it in, assuming this data is new, like what problems does that create? Um, so I just, I'm curious to hear what you guys think about that. Yeah, so, so I think model collapse is actually a real issue. Um, and we, we might actually be using AI to create more data because we don't have enough training data. There may be some unrepresentative demographic group. We don't have enough biopsy images for them. Uh, but we'll use a GAN or diffusion to create those biopsy images. But of course, we're, it's kind of like inbreeding. Mm -hmm. And we end up with mm -hmm. model collapse. And for mm -hmm. particularly for things like healthcare or, or anything to do with financial services, huge peril. Yeah, so I think model collapse, so this is, probably Jatendra is way, way better equipped to comment on it than I am, but this is something that we actually need to be thinking about, the quality of the data uh, that we're curating. Um, and getting back to the question of ethics, I think here too I have a view, which is that um, ethics is not just regulatory compliance. So we have a lot of regulatory, um, you know, a lot of regulation in place for, for data, and yet it's still possible to intrude on people's privacy. So I think um, it's incumbent on us on just as a baseline to have the regulatory compliance, but we need to go beyond that. We know what's moral, what's ethical, and for all of us, we have to make the day-to-day -day decision on anything that we're doing with the technology is, is this right? It may be permitted legally, but is it right? You know, I call it the mom test. It's, if mom knew what I was doing now, would she be proud of me? If the answer is no, don't do it. <laughs> That's a good test. Um, Anything to add to Chandra or Sandra? Uh, no, I mean, this is a very uh, uh, deep topic in a way. And I think uh, uh, I, I agree with what Shomik said. I, I feel that uh, we actually need a lot of research on this. And the research on this has to be very interdisciplinary in nature. This is not a matter for just technologists alone. 
This is a matter where they're technologists, they're lawyers, they need to be ethicists, they need to be philosophers, social scientists. It sort of touches on so many things that uh, there isn't like, uh, that I, I think there are models and uh, protocols which are not yet developed <coughs> for, for, for this. And in, you know, if you look at uh, medicine, right, the principle of informed consent, it wasn't there. I mean, they used to do very crazy and very, very unethical things in experiments uh, 50 years ago, 100 years ago. There's, if you look up the Tuskegee syphilis study, you'll get one example of something extremely evil, I would almost argue. We haven't got those protocols. Yeah. We need to find ways of making progress. We need to get models that are fair. I mean, it's just, it's just like I, I just feel like I, I don't know the answer. I think, thank you for raising the question, but that as a professor, I'm used to being able to say, this is the answer, yeah. done. No, I don't know. I just know that I don't know. Yeah, but I'm glad we're asking ourselves those questions now. Yeah. Again, back to my internet example, the things that got away from us because we didn't um, foresee uh, you know, uh, all the ways that that could go wrong. Um, and, I, and I do wanna maybe just touch on one, one uh, tangential uh, point, which is the importance of watermarking, right? And to understand what is the, you know, the original source of the, the data and the information, what is the original source of the creation and the art and the music and um, you know, the, the, the book or the story, you know, there's just so many issues around IP and so many issues around, uh, I, I think uh, uh, we mentioned you know, deep fakes and just that, that we have the technology to be able to watermark and to be able to identify what is uh, machine generated, what is the original uh, you know, body of work. And, and I think we just have to have the will to, to do that. And you know, part of the, um, you know, I like how Shum, uh, you know, phrased it in terms of you, you know it when you see it, you know right from wrong. Uh, but having a set of guidelines, some that again, for these high risk areas that are regulated and others that, you know, enterprises and, um, uh, and you know, academics, uh, academic institutions, we voluntarily sign on uh, to, to abide by a, a set of guidelines and principles, I think is, is clearly a step in the right direction. Right. Yeah, right down to actually teaching it at the undergraduate level. You know, what is the ethical use of data? What are the issues? So that everyone is familiar with it. Because right now I think that it, correct me if I'm wrong, Mr. Hendler, but yeah. students probably go out into the wild yeah. knowing nothing of this, having to self-discover, which is a peril because your boss may say, do this, 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 oh, it's fine. We're optimizing something and we have permission from the user. <laughs> so it's okay, yeah. but it's not okay. So it requires that ethical understanding. Okay, so my question is that a lot of companies are really excited to integrate AI into their work, um, but there's still a lot of questions when it comes to adoptability. So within each of your domains of expertise, whether that's LMs, computer vision, robotics, or chips, what do you think are maybe one biggest question that needs to be answered before companies can really begin to adopt um, AI within their, within their work? <coughs> Yeah, I don't know that it's so much uh, a, a question that needs to be answered. You know, right now, um, we we have an environment where there's just ideas uh, everywhere. Uh, in the words of, of uh, Andy Grove, uh, it's a bit of, um, it's kind of been okay to uh, let the chaos reign, but then reign in the chaos, right? And so, uh, so there's a bit of you know letting all the flowers uh, you know uh, bloom, but we are now focusing in on some of the efforts that we think will drive uh, the biggest advancements in in again back to productivity and efficiency. Because our purpose, which is grounded in Moore's law, is how do you make computing uh, more available and accessible, which is all about driving down costs and, and making it uh, broadly available to everybody. Again, broader market participation, broader uh, uh, availability of compute for academic institutions, faster rate of innovation, and frankly, um, uh, you know, we do believe in broad market participation and not just uh, you know, that, that computing and certainly certain areas of computing and AI should be only for 
the wealthiest companies that, that can afford, you know, tens of billions of dollars to train a, a foundational frontier uh, model. So for us, we, we're just choosing what we think uh, serves uh, our mission. Uh, best, but we have examples all over our company. We we use uh, AI in HR to do predictive analytics. Uh, high value talent that uh, you know, according to these different attributes uh, and characteristics, may be at risk to, to leave. So how do you uh, you know how do you preemptively uh, approach them so that they know they're valued and and you retain that talent? We use AI in our uh, debug uh, process in terms of. of of, uh, chips. We have a big data lake, and so clearly we've seen the signatures before on, on various uh, number of bugs. And you, you know, in the chip development process, you have you know tens of thousands of bugs uh, that uh, that are you know, that are introduced in, into that design. Uh, and so, how do you, you know, use it uh, for that purpose? I talked about the manufacturing uh, process, and again, getting. Uh, lower defect density and higher yields, again, lower cost uh, products out, out the door. Um, but we're using it really in a number of different uh, areas and and we're, we're focusing in on a few of those areas in terms of software development, silicon development, and manufacturing. But it is a little bit of right now, you know, let, let a bunch of flowers uh, bloom uh, uh, because there's just so many ideas and, and different use cases. So maybe you're a little bit more organized in your approach uh, <laughs> given you're investing in different companies. Yeah, exactly, so let me contribute a, a one-liner here for the discussion. Uh, an AI strategy is like a spleen. Everyone has one, but nobody knows what it's for. <laughs> uh, so, but yeah. uh, building on what Sandra just said, um, as an investor, I see a lot of ready, fire, aim, because hey, we need an AI strategy, and everybody's running willy-nilly into this wilderness with no idea what they're going to do. Investing is about delivering an economic return, so there must be an economic benefit from the thing that you're doing. So to answer the student's question here, the first thing to do is to see what is the business problem that we're solving, and what's the economic benefit that will accrue to us or to our customers, et cetera. When you've identified, then do your AI project. But right now, it's, hey, we have all this data, everyone's doing AI, let's go do AI, mm -hmm. and that's bound to fail because you don't end up actually solving a business problem. Yeah, maybe I'll mention a, a practical problem, but it's connected to an important scientific problem, which is that our models today are very data hungry. They need lots and lots of trading examples compared to, let's say, humans. So in a sense, we say, yeah, we can, we have achieved this level of intelligence or whatever, but it should be mentioned that it's been done by needing much, much more data than, uh, than humans. So my canonical example is driving. Okay, a kid of 16 can learn with 20 hours of driving. How many hours of driving data does Tesla need, right? <laughs> much, much more. LLMs, their numbers like 100 million words is what a kid would have learned, heard by age 10, compared to what are the number of tokens in LLM. This is fine. Technologically, we don't have to replicate exactly human development. But the consequences are that uh, there are certain kinds of biases which show up because certain demographics are underrepresented. This is a big deal in biometrics, right? If you're going to be at, uh, nowadays all our passports are, and our face are being used as IDs at airports and all the rest. And if the systems there don't work as well for certain demographics because there wasn't enough training data. This is a inconvenience, but inconvenience becomes unfairness or injustice uh, for people. Uh, there are lots of important <coughs> social applications. Applications, uh, let's say ecological monitoring. I mean, I have a friend who is interested in monitoring wildlife movements and such. Now that's not a business for which there's like, tons of money, right? But it is very important because it's, in fact, connected to global warming and things like that. If we had models which could be trained with less data, they would be more easily applicable for many more applications from people who are not richly bankrolled. But this, to me, then becomes a scientific problem. By solving a scientific problem of uh, techniques which re require less data, I'm actually helping with the societal problems. So everything is interlinked. Yeah, and actually there's even, there's a tension too in AI of accuracy versus fairness. Yeah. You know, let's say if an AI, yeah. you know, medical algorithm is 90% accurate for the racial mi uh, majority, only 65% you know, for the racial minority. Or you can put it off versus one that's 70% accurate for both. What's more important, accuracy or fairness? I don't know the answer, but this is the kind of stuff that we need to think through. And this is why I think it's incumbent on, on us 
not just to train students, but even employee bases on these are the kinds of issues that are coming to head. Never existed before. One more back here. Hi, thank you all for sh so much for sharing your perspectives. So as a bioengineering student and researcher, I found it really interesting to hear all of your perspectives, especially your comments on the on biometrics and then also your comment on how AI can be used as a biomarker. So I was interested in all of your perspectives on how AI is might revolutionize healthcare and also in what directions AI might push the biotech industry. Yeah, so um, it's a great question. It turns out that uh, you know, thanks to machine learning, everything is a data signal for everything. So if you look at yeah, if you look at the uh, the published academic literature, the tone of my voice will tell you whether I have coronary artery disease. The tone of my voice can also be used for Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, uh, PTSD, all kinds of things. Your photographic image can be used to actually also map the state of your health, because you know if you're 30 and you look like you're 50, you're in good health. If you're 50, you look like you're 30, not so good health. Uh, both Facebook and Google have patents on facial images for classifying health, and uh, Amazon has one for using your voice. So think about how scalable this makes healthcare. And so, you know, we have the most powerful healthcare device ever sitting in our pockets. It's called a smartphone. But we need to be able to harness that so that we can actually bring the equity of healthcare to all the people who don't get it. 45% of the countries in the WHO nowadays have less than one physician per thousand people which means unless you, you know, have your heart attack right in front of the one doctor, you're going to die, right? So can we think about using AI and these mobile devices to help address that inequity? Yeah, and I, I do think that um, there's so much that is going to happen in terms of personal, personalized medicine, right, and uh, individualized um, care and uh, protocols based on your unique uh, you know, situation and your uh, unique uh, you know makeup and and um, you know health uh, condition. And from that perspective, I do think that you know this is one area where we we can do so much good uh, as opposed to um, you know just kind of the average uh, protocol for treating a, a disease to to truly be able to to personalize it. Uh, personalize it. And I, I think that one of the things that we see as a big opportunity here is, of course, that this idea of federated learning where the data is anonymized, um, but it is made available broadly to uh, all institutions that, that participate without necessarily um, sharing in, you know, the individual data. You use uh, the data from that large database, data lake, but then you can mine that for your individual uh, situation. So I, I do think that this is a, a, a big area of opportunity. Uh, and as Shumit points out, the more economic, uh, economical we can make it, uh, then we can reach so many more uh, people across the globe that, you know, can't afford the, you know, certainly the cost of care in, in the United States, but elsewhere in terms of just the access to all of that body of work and learning that happens over, you know, massive amounts of, of data that is now available. Um, to each individual case. I mean, my colleagues here have referred to uh, better diagnostics and personalized medicine. I'll add another one, which is uh, drug design. So drug design can, is very expensive, very tedious. Lots of experimentation is needed. Whatever you can do in silico is uh, much faster. And we could synthesize uh, molecules. We could predict their properties using machine learning techniques, and this might be a major, major impact on, on life, right? Because uh, diseases of various sorts which uh, could be tackled with these new drugs. Yeah, and in the old days, I go to a lab and have a blood sample taken. That's my biomarkers. In the current day, here's my biomarkers right there. It's called a Fitbit. <laughs> Uh, so I, I, I think uh, back to uh, one of the spe speakers' uh, view is that uh, a, a six-year-old, a 16-year-old can drive a car, you know, w without much data, and also the goal master can, you know, even though he's he was beaten by by, by AlphaGo, but you know, all he needed was like a cup, a cup of tea, right? AlphaGo, how much power does it need? <laughs> and and with that, you know, our, our body is evolution. Uh, the the way our body works is I, I have a biology background, and it's uh, by millions of years evolution. And with the AI, the, with that we can augment it, our, our physiology, but we lose the ability to use our body's function, brain function, physical function, right? And then uh, gradually we may lose that function, you know, uh, kind of uh, 
I, I, I can think of an uh, extreme uh, example like dinosaur. They may invented AI millions of years ago. They, they do not need to do anything else. But you know, everything is provided by AI, right? But however, some meteor shut, shut down all the power. <laughs> they lose the electricity. <laughs> then all of a sudden, they forgot how to survive in the wild. Then maybe that's the reason they got extincted. So any, <laughs> any, I don't know if it's a good question or not, but you know, any thoughts on that? <laughs> Yeah, wasn't that the plot of Wally, actually? <laughs> I, was, yeah. I was thinking Wally. <laughs> Interesting. Okay. okay. I think um, since we start early, let's end a little early and give some of you a chance to come up and talk to our panelists yeah. a little bit longer. I think they can stay at least until 8.30. Um, let's thank the panel. Please join me in thanking our panelists. <laughs> and I'd like to just once again thank you all for coming. Um, since we do have some time, I think some of my faculty colleagues can stay and also answer some questions. So let me properly introduce them. Um, I'll ask you to stand up. Mark Asta, he's Executive Associate Dean in the college, Professor of Mechanical, uh, Material Science and Engineering. Next to him is uh, Professor Jun Chao Wu, who's the Chair of the Mechan Material Science and Engineering pr uh, Department. <laughs> and back there we have Max Fratoni, he's the Chair of the Nuclear Engineering Department. So f please feel free to ask my faculty colleagues uh, any questions. They can help. <laughs> I and think our, they, they can help. Our students will be back at their posters. And students will be back at their posters. And then Jasmine, you you and your college relations team members, maybe have everybody stand up so we can see if you have any questions about opportunities to engage or to support our students and our programs, uh, please look for one of our college relations team members. And I'd like you to thank you all for your support. And once again, thank you to Deirdre and to Synopsis for hosting this event. I hope you find it to be enjoyable, enlightening, and um, all I can say is, Go Bears! <laughs>